welcome to the Actual Tech Media Megacast. My name is Jess and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information to cover with you. Let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. Now, if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Also, keep in mind that if you have any tech issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's megacast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all of your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentations. And if we do not get to your question during the webinar, don't worry, because the awesome experts that we have here with us today will be following up with you after we wrap. All right, next up on our tour, there are going to be lots of cool aha moments in the megacast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there in your audience console and the hashtag for today's megacast will automatically get added to your post. And our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection of solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. And if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes we will be giving away throughout the Megacast today. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. You do need to be in attendance here live at the webinar in order to qualify to win a prize, and we will follow up with all winners after we wrap the Megacast today. Now, all winners must submit an IRS Form W9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, hey, if you're not sure what those are, no problem. You can find the full T's and C's in that handouts tab. Again, just click into the handouts section, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find the full T's and C's waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember here today is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. In today's megacast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all the questions asked after the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about winning and we will get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the Megacast today, and we want to keep that good feeling going. So let's connect on social. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and LinkedIn. We have lots of great content, and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content right away after we wrap, you want to jump right in, make sure that you subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and to grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or coworker to the Actual Tech Media webinar series. Now you're gonna find a link to do that right there in that handouts tab, and you will also be automatically redirected after we wrap today. Now both you and your coworker, your friend could win a prize, and we actually hold those drawings every month. So be sure you refer somebody awesome before you head out today. It could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab and fill out the application. Then the actual tech crew will match you with some vendors that we think you should be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you can choose to join in like surveys or test running new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you will learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply or hey, send that link to a decision maker in your team. Now I wanna take a quick minute here to remind you about one of my favorite resources and that is ransomware.org. You can find everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, how to prevent and recover. This site is jam packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. So go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books offered by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books are gonna work on your Kindle, your mobile device, and they are completely free, super easy. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide, and there's a link for you in the handouts tab as well. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of important things already, and I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get rolling. All right. Thanks so much, Jess. Really appreciate that introduction here to today's Megacast. The topic, of course, is enforcing zero trust in your organization, looking at the market landscape. I'm excited to be joined today by experts at Keeper and progress. We've got a great mega cast lined up for you here. Uh, before we get started, there's just a few things that you should know about the event. Um, my name is David Davis from Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as one of the moderators. Uh, you've already met Jess uh, here in just a moment. You'll be meeting Keith Ward, and we've got a great, uh, again, mega cast here uh, planned out. Um, as Jess mentioned, we've got uh, folks commenting there in the questions pane of the audience console. We love to see your hello and good afternoons from across the United States and around the world. But we also want your technical questions on today's topic. I'll be doing Q&A sessions with our expert presenters. So keep those questions coming. And as Jess, Jess mentioned, don't forget about the two handouts there in the handouts tab, one for keeper security at the top. And right after that, a handout from progress. So we've got some great additional information. And then as Jess mentioned as well, uh, you know, this is a mega cast. I like to say we've got a mega lineup of prizes here. And so we have three Kindle scribes as well as two Amazon $300 gift cards. I'll be announcing the winners of those right after each event on, or each presentation, I should say, on the mega cast today. All right, so with that, it's now time for the keynote presentation. Welcome, Mr. Larry Swe Seltzer, uh, hosted by Mr. Keith Ward. Take it away, Keith. Hi, everyone. Uh, today for this event, I am delighted to be joined by Larry Seltzer, the one and only. Larry is a security analyst. He's a writer. He has a CISSP certification, so he knows his stuff. And we are so happy, Larry, to have you on with us today. Welcome. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely. So today, Larry, we are talking about zero trust, a, uh, a concept that is still, you know, relatively new, I guess you could say, in, in the industry. I, I, maybe, maybe not. But um, <laughs> in any event, that is the, the focus for us today. And so let's start with the basics here. Why is zero trust becoming increasingly important in today's environments? Because it wasn't not all that long ago, was it? Well, no, but I mean, every enterprise and every employee are more connected now than ever. I mean, it's a long time since the days when you could just set up strong perimeter defenses and trust everything that got inside them. And this is for at least two reasons. I mean, so much of the enterprise's computing occurs outside the perimeter, services like Office 365 and Salesforce. The second, any modern enterprise is large and complicated enough that some attackers will get inside the perimeter. All they have to do is compromise one trusted user uh, through a software exploit or social engineering. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna take a moment to give a brief definition of zero trust as, as I understand it. It's the idea that at any point where a user or a program attempts to access a resource, I mean, it could be a file, a network connection, an API, it has to prove its identity and that it has the privileges to access the resource. Now, you might assume that Microsoft and Salesforce are good at securing their systems maybe better than you. And you're probably right about that, but it doesn't really make a difference. I mean, I use Office 365 and I see threats get through an email now and then. And your own users, if your own users are inside the perimeter, it's only a matter of time and probably not a lot of time before attackers are too. So zero trust is a philosophy that even in what you might think of as the most trusted of places, you can't trust anything. Um, 
Now, it, actually, I'm going to step back uh, from that for uh, a bit. You can't really trust anything, but as a practical matter, you're going to end up having to do it. Um, like I said, it's a philosophy. Zero trust is an aspiration. To the extent that you can implement it, you will be more secure. But there's a lot of resource accessing going on in a modern enterprise, and there are many impediments in the way to making zero trust easy to access. So, for instance, you need um, to have a fully built out IAM implementation that's identity and ac identity access and management. And, and that itself is something that's not there in a lot of enterprises. It's a lot of work. Um, in this and other ways, the basic tools for implementing zero trust are, are not yet generally available. So you mentioned zero trust as aspirational. Lots and lots of vendors, including many on the event today, have zero trust offerings, what they label as zero trust offerings. So would it be fair to say that zero trust is also a product or can it be a product? Well, not really, but it can and should be built into products. I mean, to be fair, systems like Office 365 and Salesforce and a lot of others are basically there. If you, the customer, do everything you're supposed to do by building out your IAM, defining who everyone is and what their privileges are, then these systems will effectively implement zero trust in their use. If, on the other hand, you're sloppy with your user group definitions and access management rules, then these systems will implement all the excessive trust you ask of them, um, at least to the extent that they function correctly, which is almost always the the time they they you know they will let you uh, implement zero trust, and then there are other products which can form a large part of a zero trust network. Uh, there's a category of network service called Secure Access Service Edge or SASE, which provides WAN access. All access in and out of your network goes through the service, which uh, authenticates all parties. Uh, you can and should use it to control access to other cloud services like Salesforce. Okay, um, great. So, um, you, you, Zero Trust is not a product, although it should be built in. So, uh, companies that want to implement Zero Trust, um, what are the first couple of steps that you recommend they take in order? One, two, or three you know, steps, for example, here? Uh, in a sense, zero trust is nothing new. It's a re-emphasis of several security best practices that have been well known for a long time. Two big ones are role-based access control and the principle of least privilege. So the first thing I would do is make sure that these are understood and implemented across the, uh, the company in a coordinated way. Role-based access control is the idea that access to resources should be granted and may be denied, not to specific users, but to groups corresponding to roles, which are functional definitions of users. By granting membership in these groups, you grant and revoke principles. Uh, no, you grant and revoke privileges um, of the users in them. So this is called the role scope. What the roles are might be different in different organizations. The way I see it, whether someone's in management or not should not be a reason to grant them permission to resources for which they don't have a specific business need, but others might disagree. And in a small organization, it might be harder to rigidly segregate access. But you might see how there could be, say, finance roles with some more privileged than others, the same for human resources, the same for IT, and each of those would have access to particular resources related to their functions. A good IAM, and once again, that's Identity and Access Management System, is where you would implement uh, this. Um, it'll also let you tighten controls on specific critical resources, for instance, by requiring a special second factor. Um, there are many benefits to role-based access control, not all of them directly security related. With hundreds or thousands of employees, security is more easily maintained by limiting 
unnecessary access to sensitive information based on each user's established role in the organization. It reduces the need for administrative paperwork, uh, figuratively speaking, um, when an employee is hired or changes role. If an employee leaves the company, I mean, you can remove the user, or make it active, or you could just remove them from all their roles, um, even if you don't delete the account. It, the user will be without the privileges. It reduces the potential for error when assigning user permissions. It makes it easier to grant outside users access to specific resources. Uh, the principle of least privilege is that all, only those users who really need access to a resource should have access to it. The principle argues against, for example, granting senior management access to everything. If you do that, and one of their accounts is compromised, the whole infrastructure is compromised. If anyone, if anyone has access like that, the account should be very hard to access. Um, implementing this principle also, it requires a lot of conscious management. So um, follow those principles and you're certainly most of the way to a zero trust network. Um, make them rules that everyone knows have to be followed and you'll have a network that's really hard to compromise. I love those first steps, Larry. And you know why I love them so much? They're free. To <laughs> Anyone can implement them. Um, and you should have been doing it all along. And it and it's exactly, it's how you need to be thinking. Uh, and it won't cost you a penny. Now this zero trust can get expensive, but at the beginning, you know, it, it's stuff you can and should be doing anyway. Uh, Larry Seltzer, um, thank you so much for this overview of zero trust and implementing zero trust in your network. Uh, it's been a real delight to have you on today. Oh, thanks. Thanks again for asking me on. All right. Great interview there with Keith and Larry Seltzer. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope that everyone out there in the audience did as well. We got some great uh, comments and questions already rolling in uh, from Craig and Louise. Uh, thank you, both of you, for your comments and questions about the keynote. I've just brought up a poll for everyone out there in the audience. I want to get your feedback on this poll. The question is, what's your time frame for adding new or updating existing IT solutions at your company? And I want to specifically clarify what we're talking about here are zero trust solutions or security solutions, at least in general. So are you looking to do something you know, relatively soon in the next six months, implement a new security solution, maybe six to 12, maybe you know, in the next uh, latter part of uh, the year or first part of next year, maybe 12 to 24, or maybe you're not quite sure. We wanna get your feedback on this poll and then I'll be introducing you to our first presenter and this one's gonna be a lot of fun. So uh, if you haven't responded to these polls before, just do it right there in the uh, slides window of your audience console. Let's get just a couple more responses. All right, thank you. You know who you are. Thank you for your response, I appreciate it. And with that, we can move on to our first presentation. And with that, uh, I'm excited here to welcome Jonathan Padilla, who's a solutions engineer at Keeper Security. And he'll be interviewed by Jess Steinbach, who you met earlier here in the Megacast. And, you know, since this is Halloween, this is going to be a Halloween themed uh, presentation or interview, I should say. And, and this is going to be a lot of fun. So here we go. Did I scare you? Absolutely. I was really confused about what was going on there. I thought I was meeting with a Jess today. No. And not with Jaws. Terrifying you know, it... shark. <laughs> that's, that's who you're meeting with. This is this is full disclosure, Jonathan. Little tidbit fun fact about me. I am horribly phobic about sharks. So this actually is the scariest costume that I own. I see that that you are uh, representing a beautiful uh, cultural reference point for all of us. Are you going to paint us some pictures today? Yeah, and today I'm going to paint you a completely different picture than what you're probably used to. I want to <laughs> I want to paint you a a, a picture uh, of the five scariest cyber attacks in any organization, institution, or personally. 
Okay, ready? Ooh, now that that is scary. Now you know I used to love sharks. No. I'm not so sure now. Terrifying, terrifying. All right, Jonathan, we're ready to be scared. I, I'm, I'm pumped up. Let's do this. Take it away. All right, let's get right into it. And let me go ahead and start painting you that picture. The first scariest cyber attack I want to focalize on is a phishing attack. This is our first scariest cyber attack. It is seriously old fashioned and it's seriously old school. It's been around since the beginning of the internet, since AOL, that, that dial up that you used to hear. And why is it so popular though? Something so simple. Why is it so popular? Because it works and it works very well. And let's look at the simplicity of it. A user receives an email. Uh, they're looking at it and they start getting freaked out because this email is articulating that their account has been compromised. Um, they must go here to change their information. And as you're looking at the URL, it looks pretty darn familiar to you, uh, to maybe a popular site, but maybe, maybe just misspelled just a tad with one, one letter. You go to that site, you start filling all sorts of information, passwords, uh, credit card information, employee passwords. You start revealing sensitive information to that cyber criminal. And let's take a look at the statistics on it and how, how, how this works so well. Look at this. This is 32% of all successful breaches involve phishing. Something very simple. Something that your end users or yourselves are vulnerable to. 64% of organizations report attempts at least once in their history of a phishing attack. And this is something that we all now uh, on a regular basis try to train on and understand and identify when this comes in. So this is becoming normal in our da daily lives. We all understand what a phishing attack is and and what it may look like, but they're getting better and better, especially utilizing technologies such as like chat GPT to uh, create and articulate some uh, verbiage that's uh, convincing. Uh, look at this, right? A phishing attack occurs every 40 seconds in the US. <laughs> that is a lot, that is a lot. That means uh, in the time that we've been communicating here, several phishing attacks has, has happened. Look at that, 3.92 million. That, that's an average breach on one of these phishing attacks or cost on one of these phishing attacks. That's, that sounds uh, appealing, doesn't it? That sounds appealing. It makes you realize uh, how intelligent and, and what kind of tool sets and tactics that the, the, the cyber criminals are utilizing. They're becoming very successful. Let's, let's take a look at the second scariest. All right. The second scariest. Um, uh, attack. It's it's credential stuffing attacks and password spraying. Now, I, I group these two together as well because they're both so similar in nature. Right? They take advantage of bad password practices. Okay, for example, cyber criminal gains access to someone someone's maybe email password, for example, and they discovered that uh, and now they're going to utilize that. They're going to utilize that because there's something in the human element that we tend to do. Bad pra uh, password practices, whether it's reuse passwords or just weak passwords in general. Uh, at the end of the day, this criminal has a, a set of credentials and the credentials that they know breached of yours. And they're going to utilize that. They're going to reuse that password. And the same username, for example, on multiple sites now, uh, uh, banking sites, uh, gaming sites, uh, uh, shopping sites, for example. Uh, and this, this is the practice of, uh, of a stuffing attack that a cyber criminal will use, will use against a user or a password spraying attack. They have scripts. They don't need to do this stuff manually. Uh, by the way, they're not going, Oh, I'm going to go to Amazon. I'm going to go to this site. I'm going to go to, uh, this banking site. Uh, no, a lot of this, these processes are automated with scripts and tools and utility sets that allow these attacks to happen in thousands of succession. Uh, and that's pretty scary. That's pretty scary uh, 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 when it comes to that type of attack. Let's take a look at the third scariest cyber attack, secret sprawl and hard-coded credentials. This is the one that freaks me out the most, absolutely freaks me out the most. And why? Why does it freak me out the most? I love infrastructure as much as I love painting. And so let's take a look at that. Let's take, let's, let's paint the picture on this. In, in, in infrastructure, secret sprawl and hard-coded credentials, th this is used by a certain subset of users, by the way, specific subset of users, DevOps, SecOps, programmers and engineers, for example. 
uh, maybe utilizing CI CD command pipelines like Jenkins, Ansible, GitHub, working with files like JSON files, YAML files, scripts, PowerShell scripts, uh, bat files, .sh bash scripts. A lot of times, uh, when people in DevOps and SecOps are, are, are generating these scripts and utilizing these utilities, they tend to utilize information in clear text. Right? You look at that JSON file, that YAML file, there you see hard-coded credentials being utilized to do a certain function or a PowerShell script or, or whatever it may be. And in every single system and code that, or, or person that's, that's accessing and utilizing these credentials is now an attack factor is an attack vector for that cyber criminal doing that secret sprawl, searching for those hard-coded credentials within the infrastructure. And once it's found, and once all this information is found, immediately it will get used against your infrastructure. So those are the scary ones for me. Those are the scary ones for me. And some of these things are, are things like passwords, or usernames, passwords, API keys, SSH keys, tokens. These are the things that make us all too vulnerable. Once cyber criminal gains access to that information, they can do functions uh, uh, with with utilities and tool sets within the infrastructure. That's a seriously scary one. The fourth scariest cyber attack is ransomware attacks. So let's take a look at this. Malware that prevents users or organizations and entire companies from accessing their files and data on their devices, on their servers, on their NAS systems, on their distributed file systems. I think we may have been there before. I've seen these attacks uh, so many times throughout my IT career. Uh, ransomware is a, is a multi-billion dollar industry. I mean, seriously. I remember my friend's dad's laptop got a ransomware attack, and I was looking at it uh, for the first time in a while and thinking, oh, my God, this has become very sophisticated. All of these files are locked, and, and in order to gain access to those files, we had to pay, or someone had to pay, had to pay some money. Uh, to gain access back to that information. And, and so it doesn't matter if this attack could only pull $100 or it's going to pull multi-billion dollars. These attacks happen to uh, end users, uh, consumers, uh, as well as enterprises and organizations. And these attacks come in so simply, again, through email, a malware, a file, takes them to a site, downloads a file uh, that, that is a ransomware attack. Uh, a, a file on their desktop, a, fi a file that's on a USB drive that they stuck into their or laptop or server. Uh, these attacks happen very quickly and spread and sprawl through the network and organization or your own personal device uh, very fast. And to try to gain access back to your information is near next to impossible. Uh, payment is usually the price you pay uh, for your files. That's a very scary one. Last but not least, let's look at the fifth and spookiest cyber attack, remote desktop protocol attacks. Now, this one is seriously scary. Number one, I always find that someone's personal laptop that they just purchased from the store has RDP, a remote desktop, turned on and completely available. That's scary. Now that's scary. And so let's think about this one. Let's talk about it real quick. Cyber criminals attempting to gain access to or control a remote computer using RDP protocols. Right? All these attack vectors that we were talking about, stuffing attacks, sprays, uh, sprawls, is what is going to lead the cyber criminal to gaining access to these credentials. Uh, IT people, admins utilizing remote desktop protocol credentials, copying, pasting, having them available in, in clear text, copying and pasting saves in memory. Uh, cyber criminal gains access to maybe the clear text in a file that they were saving on their desktop in a, in a spreadsheet possibly. Uh, but at the end of the day, a cyber criminal accessing information such as RDP uh, uh, credentials. Uh, and protocols. I can even say SSH and VNC, right? Exploiting vulnerabilities with insecure systems, exposed services, and vulnerable network endpoints. That's what's happening there. They gain access to these credentials, and all of a sudden, they have access to these endpoints. They have access to these endpoints. Ah, I got your RDP credentials. Hey, you were saving your SSH credentials in your .SSH directory on your Windows machine or your Linux machine. I know a lot of you DevOps, SecOps people know what I'm talking about. And within that .SSH directory, public-private key pairs are there, known host files. And all of a sudden, I'm going to snatch that, and I'm going to start SSHing myself 
with with no issues uh, to your systems because I have your and once they have access to those systems, they will control your entire infrastructure. I've seen this type of company take over before, and it's not pretty. So that stated, let's look at something. Let's look at something. Do we notice a pattern here? Right? Do we notice a pattern here? 74% of all breaches include human element. And this is true. It's the human element that's causing this. Uh, uh, weak passwords, reused passwords, clear text passwords being saved on a notepad or a spreadsheet. Or, or, or again, uh, uh, DevOps, SecOps, uh, using this information in scripts and code and their SDKs. And their CI CD command pipelines, uh, use of stolen recycled credentials. Just look at all these, look at all these, look at all these vectors, privileged credentials, abuse, misuse, social engineering. That's a big one. Insecure remote connections. Again, uh, using that information in clear text, having access to it, copying and pasting. You know, what if, what if someone, what if one of your admins was an inside man and they had access to that information with and with with, without being at the organization, with them being at the organization or with them being, without them being at the organization. Once they leave that organization, they had access to that information. A lack of a visibility into problems like hard-coded credentials. Again, these are more of the DevOps, SecOps problems. And when we go into secrets management, we talk about um, config files and CI CD command pipelines and clear text information being utilized. That pattern is all the human element. Us humans, we are the ones utilizing this information to do functions and actions, or rather personal in our lives or in our jobs. What can we do about all this? Can we protect ourselves from these attack vectors? Absolutely, absolutely. Let's look at Keeper Pam. Keeper Pam. It's the next best thing since this picture I painted. And so what is Keeper Pam? Without getting too far into the weeds, um, it's an easy to use a uh, cybersecurity platform to protect these these scary cyber attacks that we were just talking about. Let's just dig in. Let's look at the three bullet points, password security and encryption. Oh, well, what is that? What is it doing? Well, this is going to be helping your end users as well as your DevOps, SecOps users, your admin users, uh, rather personal or business. This is going to protect the credentials and the passwords of which you are utilizing to enter into websites and into applications. Okay, that's number one. Let's protect those because that is a fail point. That is a fail point of end users having long, strong, unique passwords. And where are you storing them? And where are you protecting them? Let's look at this second uh, second bullet point here. Privileged account and session management. This is those RDP uh, protocols or accesses that you're doing to servers or SSH or VNC or, or maybe Kubernetes clusters and SQL databases that you are accessing. You don't want clear text access to that information. You don't want to be handling that information in clear text, saving in clear text, copying and pasting that information being saved in memory. So we're going to be protecting privileged account and session management. We're going to take a look at that. And last but not least, secrets management uh, for those uh, secrets sprawl into your infrastructure for you DevOps, SecOps uh, users. We're going to take a look at that with the Keeper Pam platform. And, and so, so what is Keeper Pam? It's a, it's a comprehensive uh, cybersecurity platform that will protect all these vectors, all these cybersecurity uh, checkpoints and, and cyber threats. Let, let's check this out. Let's check this out. The password manager. Uh, again, this is uh, storing passwords in an encrypted fashion and securely. But this is going to allow end users as well as uh, admin users to generate long, strong, and unique passwords per individual website, per individual application. And why do I say it that way? Why do I say it that way? Again, we don't want to be reusing credentials for, for multiple sites, multiple systems. Bad actor, a cyber criminal gets access to one, they get access to all. So generating long, strong, unique passwords uh, that, that aren't so easily breachable for each web application or app or system we're utilizing against. Securely store pass keys. Man, I really wish I can talk more about this one, but this is a this is a big subject, right? Pass keys are becoming like the thing, like Jonathan, usernames and passwords are going away. Well, yeah, you're correct, but Keeper's not going away. We need to securely store these pass keys. You know, I, I, I don't know if, if many of you heard of pass keys or now becoming aware of them, and I, I, I hope you guys start understanding and start asking yourselves, where am I supposed to save this? 
How am I supposed to use this? Right, so securely storing pass keys is going to become big. This is, be, this is something that's getting pushed down on us through applications and websites, logins. And, and, and now we really need to secure those. I, I'm just thinking to myself, how do normal consumers know what to do with these? All of this would enforce 2FA and password policies company-wide. If you aren't already, accessing this information needs to be highly secured. So, so another off method, another point, another checkpoint stating, hey, this is truly you that are accessing the, this information. So two-factor authentication, I think this is something we're all familiar with nowadays, highly important uh, when you're accessing sensitive information, infrastructure information, credential information, uh, bank information. It, 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 the, the spread is large. The spread is large. It's not just about usernames and passwords. It's about protecting all sorts of information. Uh, aside from usernames and password, credit card information, bank information, company sensitive information. All right, I like this one. I like this one. Get notified to know if any of your credentials have been breached out there in the dark web. As you're storing your information uh, within uh, the Keeper Password Manager, it's going to inform you and say, hey, this credential that you have in here, it maybe wasn't breached re uh, previously, but now, as of yesterday or as of today, as of this moment, it has been breached. What is that going to allow the end user or the administrator to do, rather manually or pragmatically? It's going to allow you to mitigate that risk prior to a risk happening. Like, oh, look, receive notica notification of a breach credential. Let me go to my Nintendo site. This is the one I had to do recently. Let me go to my son's Nintendo site. And fix that breach because my son's Nintendo site was a direct tap into my wallet. Right again, those gaming sites. We talk about password stuffing and spraying. Let's let's move on. Let's move on. Keeper Secrets Manager. Now for you DevOps, SecOps, admins, coders, uh, again using CI C D command pipelines, SDKs such as Java, Python. PowerShell, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or, or files, config files, JSON, YAMLs, uh, or any type of file you're utilizing. We're going to eliminate the secret sprawl. We're going to eliminate those hard-coded credentials within those type of files or CI CD command pipelines so they're not exposed and vulnerable and crawlable or sprawlable by that cyber criminal to find them and utilize them. Right? Identify and remove hard-coded credentials. Uh, this is important. Identify and remove. As you use uh, Keeper Secrets Manager, you're going to understand which systems are doing what, utilizing which credentials. It's going to allow you to really just clean up your infrastructure, identifying what's using what. And if something doesn't need something anymore, right, you'll have, you'll have identify key, identification that, oh, look, this system is no longer using this anymore. It's no longer needed. We can identify that, remove that from that system. So that's really nice. I, I really like that. And, and the fact that we're removing hard-coded credentials. You're not going to find my information as you open up another example, my PowerShell script that's doing a function. You're not going to find a, a, a clear text credentials in there. All right. Automate the rotation of access keys, passwords, and certificates. This is that automation I was talking about again, right? When, when you receive a notification that a credential has been breached out there in the dark web, which is which is a feature set of Keeper uh, Password Manager. But right? once you identify that something has been breached, or maybe it's just time to uh, change access keys and certificates and token keys on an automatic, pragmatic basis every 30, 60, 90 days. So rather you have to uh, click the rotation because, oh, it's been breached. Let's rotate it. Or you're going to have it happen automatically against thousands of credentials. It doesn't matter if they're Active Directory. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's SSH keys. It doesn't matter if it's an SQL account or a Linux account. Um, automating this process against thousands of credentials. This is something I've had to do previous in my life. And doing that manually, not getting reports on it, not getting insights on it. Not getting insights, hey, did that rotate a credential, rotate to a breach credential? Is it a breach credential? That's really cool secrets management. That really saves uh, a lot of time on the uh, uh, IT realm uh, when it comes to, again, mitigating, rotating a credential or the automation of credential rotations. Let's move on. Let's move on. Keeper Connection Manager. Uh, this is important as well. Again, uh, uh, some of you IT uh, admins and DevOps, again, SecOps as well, you're accessing information, you're accessing systems via RDP, 
via SSH, via VNC, via Kubernetes clusters, uh, uh, via uh, 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 SQL databases, for example. You need to access those uh, systems and uh, in, in critical infrastructure securely without well, I'll tell you my story. Uh, this is a story that we know all too well. Without maybe myself as an administrator handling, again, clear text information and credentials in which I'm copying, in which I'm pasting, it's getting saved in memory. Where am I copying and pasting that from? Is it stored in clear text? That's not a way to access, right? That is not a way to access a system. And I got these usernames and passwords. I'm going to open up RDP. Uh, and now I'm going to copy paste the information over there. I have access to the information. Okay. I could be an inside man. I could get breached. And when I get breached, that credential gets breached. Wouldn't it be better if you just provided access to say myself? Hey, Jonathan, we're going to provide you access to these servers in our environment and these systems, our environment, but we're not going to provide you the credential. We're going to provide you a pane of glass, allowing you to securely access these critical systems and infrastructure in a zero knowledge, zero trust fashion. You don't know what these credentials are. You never will know. All you do know is that I gave you access to these systems. And when you uh, gain access to them, I will know at that very moment that you did. All history will be there uh, and, and, and we can control and have more insights into our infrastructure. Role-based access controls to the entire uh, uh, system. That's always nice. Providing role-based access controls and enforcement policies such as, hey, you can't even log in and gain access to systems until 8.30 in the morning, Jonathan, and then immediately you're done at 5 p.m. Uh, for example, uh, last but not least, I love this one. I don't like agents. I've never been a big fan of agents for several reasons. Number one, if I'm an IT administrator, there goes something else I have to manage. Agents on all sorts of systems, and then updating them, uh, updating them, uh, worrying if they've been, uh, if that agent is vulnerable to a breach or not. I just don't care for agents. So uh, I'm happy to inform you that Keeper Connection Manager has no agents. It's using natural protocols such as RDP and BNC, which are already available on those systems. So why add an agent? That all stated, if you attend a demo. Here with us at Keeper Security, you will get a free three-year personal password subscription. This is a really nice feature set, and it's really nice if you if you haven't done the practice uh, of password security or obscurity with your information and protecting your information. This is a really good way to get into it, get started, understand how this is done, why it's done, and how it can protect you and, Dana. and your assets. Dana. Uh oh. Dana, I hear the Dana, sharks coming. Dana, 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 Dana. I gotta get my fin. Oh wait! Oh, oh wait! I think it's just Jess. <laughs> Shark attack! That's actually really hard to do behind the desk. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you end up standing back up, I think we're okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm upright, Jonathan. Thank you. Wait, I gotta get ready. Thank you for that spooky tour of the five. That's hard. To Absolutely. Do. Uh, I appreciate you painting us that beautiful and terrifying picture. And now we have a few questions. We're a little short on time, but we do have a few questions from the audience, but I'm just going to sneak in one or two before we got to wrap up. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Jonathan, does Keeper support pass keys? Absolutely. That is something that we briefly touched uh, in this uh, in the slides. Yeah. Um, and if you want to know more about that, absolutely, Keeper can store your pass keys, and 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 you can utilize Keeper to fill in those pass keys when needed. Okay. Awesome. Great. Quick and easy. Yes. Um, I like this. My organization is considering going passwordless. Would this increase security? And does Keeper support passwordless authentication? What do you got for our audience? Absolutely, Keeper supports passwordless authentication, whether it's pass keys or maybe you want to enter into Keeper with single sign-on, your identity provider in your organization, allowing that seamless entrance into Keeper once you seamlessly enter into Keeper. Any of those critical sites, uh, applications that you may need to enter will be done in, a, in an automatic list, uh, apologies, automatic, seamless fashion. Yeah. Uh, kind of that SSO feel, getting away, getting away from... From even if a, if a site hasn't gone passwordless, you get to get away from managing those passwords. Awesome. 
Okay. All right, Bob Ross, I'm going to sneak in one last question. Let's do this one here. Uh, how easy is it to change an existing gateway? Can you rename it, change its IP, change its DNS uh, name? What, like how customizable are we? Yeah, that's a pretty advanced question here. And, and for those of you who are listening, the gateway is uh, a service that runs on, on Mac, Windows, or Linux that allows you to do functions such as password rotation within your organization or infrastructure in a zero knowledge, zero trust fashion. Uh, the upgrade process, at least uh, if I follow the process correctly, has been pretty easy and seamless for me. I installed a new application and make sure that my, and for those who understand this, my, my JSON file, my config is still there. Once that's done, the service should restart. But I'm happy to say that we are currently uh, uh, testing uh, uh, the gateway service that will be released, uh, generally since, as soon as we're done testing, uh, that automatically updates itself, therefore leaving the end user or the administrator from having to manually do that update process. So talk about easy. That's automatic. Uh, perfect. Doesn't get any easier than that. Uh, all right, Absolutely. Jonathan. Well, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to leave it there, both because we're out of time and because this is very warm and I need to go take this off. And I'm scaring myself. <laughs> what it is. Um, but Jonathan, before you go, one last thing. Uh, the best way to get started with Keeper is it, is it you know, come and attend this demo. What, what do you recommend as the first step? Yeah, if you look down there, keeper.io forward slash free can get you started. Uh, once you go from there, you can communicate with us further if you would like to receive a full-blown demo after you have uh, looked at the platform and reviewed it, rather personally or at enterprise scale. If you'd like to know more about that, just come on and see a demo, and, um, and we'll get you started. Amazing. All right. Well... Bob Ross, thank you so much for painting us this beautiful and terrifying picture with a nice little uh, <laughs> fluffy bush at the end. Nice, exciting, uh, happy ending there. And uh, and I'm going to swim away off into the wild blue seas and go terrorize some swimmers. That sounds like an excellent idea. And I will no longer be swimming with sharks in the Bay of Florida. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Thanks, John. Have yourself a good swim, Jess. I will. <laughs>
we're going to talk about uh, some interesting topics today uh, related to zero trust and uh, basically how to ensure that as you go down that journey of implementing zero trust in your environment, you don't have a bad day. You don't wake up one morning and can't get into your computer. You don't have your customers calling and complaining about everything being dog slow. So we're going to talk about what's necessary to do that. But before I start, I'm going to give you a little bit about progress, so if you don't mind. So Progress Software has been around over 40 years. We've been, uh, we're in the Boston, Massachusetts area, headquartered there for the, for the life of the company. Started off as a database company, and we bought lots of technologies and products and developed others along the way. In that journey, we've now picked up a portfolio of products, uh, which and include things like uh, uh, Chef and, and What's Up Gold and Loadmaster, what we'll talk about today in great detail, Flowmon for Network flow, flow, flow Collection Analysis, and other products on here you may see or know already. So just real quick, this is what we are, this is what we do, these are our product lines, and we are a manufacturer of technology. Uh, we've got a lot of customers that use us, the top, you know, the Fortune 500, pretty much all of them have our technology at one point or another in their, in their infrastructure because we help them with building their presences, we help them with deploying their presences, and we help them then with operating, managing, and securing their environments. So across that entire portfolio, we have technology across almost all of these companies, well, all of these companies you're seeing on the logo sheet, but almost all the Fortune 500. And then just as a grounder, you know, what is zero trust? So I'm pulling this from the NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, Special Publication 800-207 on zero trust. So in the layman's terms, what zero trust means is you're going to treat all users and all devices as if they were coming in from outside of your network. You're not going to assume any level of trust, any level of special handling or special rights because of where that device is connecting from or who it is that's connecting from that device. You're going to authenticate everything, you're going to validate everything, and you're going to do it at more than one place. And that's the real key in zero trust is you're going to be validating access at more than one place, not just once to sign into the computer, then you have access to everything. It's going to be during that entire journey that customer has gaining access to information. So what's the typical things people are going to see that is going to impact then zero trust? What's going to cause them to notice um, slowdowns in their network. Well, one, zero trust forces authentication at several different points along the user's connection to a service. It's going to authenticate them. Uh, their device has to authenticate to the network. So there'll be an authentication process at that point. The devices have to have some level of compliance verification on connection to the network. So the compliance infrastructure that's actually checking those devices uh, to ensure that they are healthy enough to connect to your network will be, will be operating in the background. You won't see it, of course. You're going to just notice that you want to connect your device to the network, and it's going to take a little bit longer to get connected to the network. Um, how much longer depends upon how robust that backend infrastructure is. How many, and if you have more than one server doing authentication, doing validation of compliance, more than one server doing Authentication and authorization for the at the device level, you know, at the PC level or tablet or, or phone level, then the performance levels are going to be higher and your user, users are going to be able to connect it in a reasonable amount of time and not be complaining about slow connections to the network. But if not, they will. And if those back end infrastructure components are simply um, more of the same, if any one of those systems has a bad day, it's not working well, it's performing slowly, then a, a good number of your customers, if you had, let's say, just two systems in the back end doing authentication, authorization, and access control, and one of them was performing badly, 50% of your users would have a bad experience because normally DNS, domain name service, would point them at one of the two and it wouldn't care which one they are and it would just drive them to one and if it's not working, it they would have a bad day. So the technologies have been around for a long time to deal with this problem, this problem of getting users to a service reliably and making sure that service is working properly when the user connects to it. And the technology is called load balancing. 
And we're going to talk to you a little bit today about how you can use that technology in your architecture to scale your zero trust components to ensure that the availability, performance, and security of those components doesn't impact then your user's journey as you move into zero trust. The same thing is true with user authentication. You're going to be authenticating more than one place in the network. The zero trust requires you authenticate not just at your workstation, but when you connect to your network and then to the network your applications are residing on and then to the actual application server. So what used to be one authentication request now turns out to be four or more. Uh, and you're going to have to make sure your authentication and authorization infrastructure is more robust. You'll add a few more servers to do that function. And again, load balance those to make sure that users get connected to ones that work well. So <clears throat> five major tenets of zero trust. You may have seen these before. Again, it's coming out of that NIST special publication. So you're assuming that the, that, that the enemy, that the people that are trying to do you harm are already inside your network. They're not just trying to get in, they're there, and they've been there for a while. Uh, you're going to always verify access. You're never going to trust somebody simply because they have verified access before someplace else in your network, before you give them access to information. You're going to check and make sure that uh, they only have access to the information they're supposed to have access to. So there's going to be a lot of specialized controls in place related to that and infrastructure components that go along with that. And then uh, being able to see everything that's happening in your network because see, the ability to see across your network, not just at certain points in your network is really important for Zero Trust to work well. Uh, this, these are the pillars of Zero Trust, again, from that special publication. Uh, you may have seen this before. The, you'll see a lot of the authentication authorization and compliance in the user and device area. You'll notice application delivery is called out, which is another name for load balancing as application delivery. You'll see micro-segmentation where they're talking about taking what used to be a data center with a server enclave uh, and a DMZ and, a, and an edge and now carving that up into many, many additional enclaves. So there'd be an enclave for your HR system. There'd be an enclave for the database associated with your HR system. There'd be another one associated with, with the front end for your email system, back end for your email system, any mid-tier components. So you're taking your network and you're creating a lot more subnets, a lot more VLANs, a lot more segmentation in your network. And to support that and make that work well, uh, Load Balancer has been around a long time. They know how to deal with that segmented back end infrastructure, and you're going to be using them to make that all work. And then you can see other things over in it, data and analytics and visibility and orchestration and automation. And the word DevSecOps shows up again uh, in this area of zero trust. Uh, what components does progress provide? And we're not going to talk about all of them that actually help you with the zero trust model. And the ones that are shaded out in yellow are things that we can provide technology to assist in. We're going to talk mostly about that stuff on the left-hand side of the slide as well as application delivery. So the title of the, is Performance Engineering for Zero Trust, and it's really intended to give you the tools you need so that you understand what's happening and how you can improve that experience for the user, or if you're proactive, how you can get ahead of the problem and make sure the user doesn't have an experience as you begin to roll out Zero Trust technologies uh, in your infrastructure. So again, uh, to, to make zero trust work, you're authenticating a lot. You're accessing, you're making access control decisions a lot. You're validating compliance a lot. Uh, you're dealing with privileged access management and logging of all this activity and tracking all of that activity at a level that you haven't before. Uh, and you're dealing with micro segmentation and uh, carving up your application infrastructure at a level that you haven't seen before. For zero trust to be in effect, to really be effective for your organization, to deal with this concept of uh, you don't know if the user is trusted, you don't assume they are, you don't know if their device is trusted, you assume it's not, right? To deal with that kind of an environment, you're putting in a lot of infrastructure or expanding existing infrastructure. And in doing that, you just need to be cautious that you don't fall into the pitfall of if one server is not enough, just put a second server in and I'm done. Because if that one server, if one of those two behaves badly, if it doesn't perform fast, if it's stuck someplace in logic, the server's working, but the application on it's not, 
the users are going to complain because you're going to have a certain number of users that were directed to that server via DNS and they're not going to get the service they need. They're not going to be able to authenticate. They're not going to get to the application. Right? They're going to get to the application and they're going to begin getting content fed from the application and some of it's going to become uh, jerky. Some, some will show up on time. Some will show up delayed. Some uh, And that experience to the user is going to be negative. So to achieve a positive experience, you build out a robust infrastructure for authentication and authorization for both device and user. And you do that with the understanding that you need to check that infrastructure before you send a user or device request to it. And that's what application delivery controllers or load balancers will do for you. Um, the next piece of this puzzle has to do with not just performance, but resiliency. Uh, if you haven't thought of this before, if you haven't actually built out a disaster recovery site, if you're not looking at how you're going to do alternate processing, if something goes down, if a building goes down, a room goes down, a server goes down, all of that availability engineering you need to think about seriously at this point in time. Because again, there's a lot more components just in letting somebody see their email than there used to be before as you, as you go down a zero trust model or get to your uh, business applications, finance, logistics, sales, you know, those applications are going to be behind uh, authentication services. And if authentication services are all located in one space and they go down, then users can't get to that application. Um, and while that was true before, it's going to be even more compounded now because devices can't get to the network to let the user know they can't get to the application if the infrastructure goes down. So you need to look at, you know, disaster recovery, you know, high availability it needs to be highly in, in your toolkit. Again, load balancers are the ones that support both global load balancing and application load balancing can make that journey very easy for you. Um, and I use the word easy on purpose because where load balancers 20 years ago used to be difficult and expensive, in today's world, that's not true anymore. They're easy to operate and they're affordable. So you can put them where you need to to make sure your infrastructure is working well. So what is the product that we have that we think fits into this architecture? It's something we call the Loadmaster. You'll hear it as a Progress Kemp Loadmaster, lots of pieces to that. Progress is the company that bought Kemp, another company who built a product called Loadmaster. Uh, so over the years, we're going to keep the Loadmaster logo. Uh, it will always be there, but it may be Progress logo two years from now, Progress Loadmaster two years from now versus Kemp. But right now, if you'll hear the word Kemp Load Balancer or Kemp Loadmaster, they're all synonymous, all the same thing. What they are, it's an appliance that can do several different things inside of the appliance. The appliance can be a physical appliance, a virtual appliance, a cloud appliance. What is an appliance? It's, an, it's a cohesive delivered solution which doesn't require an operating system patch operating system management you know it it is a complete system that operates uh as as one unit so um the for appliances you sign into the appliance in the appliance has all the features and functions you want to patch it you patch one thing and one thing only uh, and that's how they work uh, our appliances have built in global load balancing they have built-in web application firewall. They have built in the support for authentication credentialing, uh, not the actual holding of credentials, but the ability to translate between credential types, like coming in with SAML or OAuth or certificate or RADIUS or LDAP and going out with a different form of authentication that the application backend can support. And since you're going to be doing a lot of authentication, you'll probably need to worry about a lot of translating of authentication credentials. And we can help you with that process. And then the Zero Trust Network Access or Zero Trust Access Gateway is a feature that combines these things you see, the application load balancing, the web application firewall, the authentication services, the additional logging, um, in a manner that lets you very tightly control Who's allowed to do what on a web-based service you have? For example, uh, the Steve or the group Steve is a member of can only go ahead and post content. They can't, they can't read content uh, or something in, in that nature. You can create very granular controls 
on not just who can get to a service, but what they can do when they get to a service. And that's what the Zero Trust Access Gateway or Network Access is all about. All of, this are, all of these are features that are built into the Loadmaster appliance. Um, more on the Zero Trust Network Access. So what is it that, that when you look at the marketplace for Zero Trust Network Access or Zero Trust Access Gateways, what do they all do in particular that's common? You know, they're all going to be involved in validating access. They're all going to be involved in assuring least privileged access to applications. Uh, they're all going to be dealing with micro-segmentation. They're going to provide you the ability to deal with that. They're all going to have this concept that uh, the, the user trying to access the service um, their system may be compromised. They may be okay, but their system may be. Therefore, you want to limit what that system is allowed to do with the information when you get to it. So these things are, are built into this zero network access gateway, uh, which is basically, again, it's a load balancer, an advanced load balancer that has been configured in a certain manner in order to achieve a desired outcome. And uh, you don't have to buy specialized products to meet these requirements. You can put them into things you already own today. The product we have, what's it look like? This is the front face plate on one of our uh, higher end products. This one goes up to 100 gigabits per second. It has two network, four network interfaces at 100, 4 at 25, and then 8 at 10. Uh, and uh, we scale from these all the way down to devices that have one gig interfaces uh, or even virtual appliances that run as slow as 500 megabits per second. So the, the key is that the technology is there. It comes in all different sizes. It comes in price points which are affordable and very affordable. If you're used to buying from the large three, you're going to find that these products are, are uh, uh, amazingly affordable uh, to put in place. And they achieve your desired outcome, which is I'm going down the zero trust path. I'm now having to build a robust infrastructure for authentication, authorization, access control, privilege access management, uh, you know, all of that stuff that's now being done in the background to let a user to connect to a network. And we're doing that now with, with these technologies. And that is the end of my presentation, and we're open for questions. Well, great presentation, Mike. That was really cool. And I know the audience has a number of questions for you. While we take questions from the audience, we're just going to bring up this poll for everyone out there. We do want to get your feedback on the poll question. It's on the screen in the slides window. It says, what additional information would you like about the progress solution? So we'll leave that up here for a little while and let everyone respond. Um, let's see, Mike, I'll go ahead and just start with this question. Um, they're asking, can configured services leverage third-party identity provider integration for authentication and authorization? Uh, yes. The yeah, simple answer is yes. Um, the, the Where the authentication, author, for example, uh, let's say you want to go and use uh, Microsoft's uh, directory service in Azure to hold credentials. Uh, the standards it uses to, to present that information is an open web services standard, OAuth, OIDC. Uh, and the ability to integrate that into the Loadmaster platform is simply a couple of checkboxes and type in some parameters and it's done. So uh, we can support external authentication services. We can support internal to your data center if you've got your own active directory infrastructure. If you've built out something that uses LDAP or Radius, we can support those things as well. Secure ID, one-time password solution sets. So uh, load balancers have been around a long time, and they've had to deal with very robust authentication environments uh, from all and, and diverse authentication environments for a long time. So yes, we understand how to use both internal and externally facing authentication services. Very nice. And then what about, you know, you talked about a lot of different features here of the Loadmaster solution. Are those included by default? Are there different, you know, additions or how does that work? So for progress, what we've done is we ship a product out, a uh, physical virtual cloud that has all the code bits in it. So there's no need to be installing extra stuff to make things turn on. But to turn them on, it's based upon the service level subscription that you buy that goes along with it. 
So basically you buy a product and you buy a level of support and that level of support enables features on the platform. Nice. Yeah, that makes it simple. I like keeping it simple. Um, let's see, here's another good question. Um, Amir is asking about, uh, do you know if the appliance supports interface bonding for increasing the throughput um, through the appliance? Uh, yes, uh, we use the industry standard, uh, inter you know, the LACP industry standard bonding technologies so that you can create a bond group uh, of uh, any number of interfaces. Most commonly, you know, with the higher end appliances, there's like four 100 gigs. You can bond all four together and have a 400 gig pipe being presented to the load balancer. The load balancers themselves can't operate at 400 gigabits per second, right? They operate at, at 100 gigabits, you know, and below as far as the ones we own today. Uh, now, what happens two, two years from now, anybody's guess how fast they'll run. Uh, because we're leveraging the power of Intel, the power of uh, the processor uh, to improve the performance of the platform. So we end up doing things which, as the processors improve, so do our performance levels. But yes, bonding is supported. Uh, you can bond uh, any number of interface, like interfaces. So four one hundred, you can bond four twenty fives. You can bond four four tens. You can bond eight tens. You can bond to create pipes of larger sizes. Excellent. And then here's an interesting question from Scott. He's asking, um, you know, can you ever lock things down too much? <laughs> I'm guessing the answer to that is, of course, yeah, you can lock it down so no traffic comes through. But um, maybe to take that to a higher level, do you have any advice on how do your uh, clients successfully kind of find the the happy medium of zero trust, you know, without locking things down too much or having things too open? Well, in, in our world, you know, a key component in zero trust is going to be, you know, inspecting the traffic that is allowed to go through to the back end application servers. So there's a web application firewall built into the platform and that is designed to support uh, easy identification of um, triggered events in the platform. So we have the ability to you, you, you basically turn the WAF on, you set a scoring threshold, a blocking level as being very, very high. So it doesn't block anything initially. Then you can look and see exactly what's firing, what rules are firing. And you will know then where you should set that value, where that, where that threshold should be for blocking actions for every individual application that you load balance. So we're not a WAF for everything. We're a WAF for each individual item that you load balance, which means you have great tunability in the platform, uh, including the ability to do custom rules. So uh, some of our customers, you know, they have an API call they make through the load balancer. And that API call is extremely rigid in what it looks like. It looks exactly the same every single time. So we read, we have a custom rule built that says if it looks like this, it's good. If it looks like anything else, it's bad and don't let it through. And you have an extremely secure interface to a backend system at that point. Very nice. Yeah, I like that. I like that flexibility. That's a smart approach. All right. Well, I'm afraid. I think we're running out of time here in our, you know, live presentation slot. But if folks want to get started with this solution from Progress, what do you recommend? Uh, well, but first thing uh, is our website, progress.com, uh, would take you to all the different product lines we have to include the load balancer product line. Uh, we typically have subsites uh, with different names for our product lines. So if you go to Loadmaster, you'll end up with going to loadmaster.com, another website. There is a download link that you can get a download and evaluation copy of our product uh, that's good for 30 days with full support. It licenses at the highest level for the, for the virtual appliance, uh, which means it'll run 15 gigabits per second or faster. It has WAF and everything else turned on and support's available for it. Um, if you're interested, Network Chuck a while back did a little special on Loadmaster and actually recommended you grab the free version and put it in your house because it was so useful to help you with locking down security in your environments. So you may go ahead and take a peek at the old Network Chuck video on Loadmaster and see what you think about that as well. Very cool, actually. I'm going to check that out for my, my own home network. 
uh, I have seen Network Chuck's videos before, so uh, that's a cool tip. Um, and excellent uh, resources there as well in the handouts tab. I want to recommend everyone check out uh, the PDF that you can download from Progress Software. It's entitled Kemp Zero Trust Access Gateway. It's the full reference guide you can download and find out just tons of additional details, including architecture uh, and, and much more. So make sure you check that out. All right. Well, Mike, gr again, great presentation. Thank you so much for being on the Megacast today. Well, thank you for letting me talk. And please, everybody, remember what used to be hard and difficult isn't anymore. So don't believe that everything has to be difficult in your life. And we'll make it where our goal is to make your life a lot easier. So thank you for your time. That's great advice for anyone out there who's, you know, a little fearful of, of zero trust or um, adding additional layers of security in their enterprise. Uh, it doesn't have to be as hard as you think it is. And um, some great solutions here on the Megacast today to make it easy for everyone out there uh, because we need more security, but we don't need more complexity. So with that, it's time to wrap up the Megacast today with our final grand, grand prize announcement. Uh, let's see, we have an additional Amazon $300 gift card. This is going to Mark Ankeny from Michigan. Congratulations, Mark from Michigan. And then our final two grand prizes, we've got uh, Kindle Scribes. These are going to Nelson Rodriguez from California and Haley Summer from Illinois. Congratulations to all of our prize winners on the Megacast today. Uh, if you are on the event today and you happen to be a potential sponsor of an upcoming event, um, reach out to us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. And then of course, uh, we've got additional events coming up. In fact, hey, this one's tomorrow. Next Generation Endpoint Management and Protection Solutions and Strategies. Uh, this is a Megacast happening tomorrow with solutions from uh, many companies there you see on the right. So make sure that you check those out. Look for an invitation to that or visit events.actualtechmedia.com for more information. All right. I want to give a big thank you to our audience for joining us on the Megacast today. I hope that you learned a lot and I hope that you have a great day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.